Well, thank you for coming tonight. We're beginning the book of Ezra. Uh, and there's several things that are going to take place here. We're actually doing, in a sense, the, the Persian books that we start talking about. We put Joel here and finish the book of Joel. That would come after all of these events. So in a sense, we're going back in time uh, on our time chart here. Again, we're not sure when Joel was written. I'm putting it here, right at the rise of the Greek Empire. Uh, that seems to fit, but that's to be decided. We're actually going to go back to 539 BC, and even before that, do a little bit of reviewing. But as you can see right here, we've got the book of Ezra taking place there. Uh, and part of that is just historical. And then we're going to have the book of Haggai, Zechariah, with Ezra taking place here. And it's not until we get to... Uh, right here, Nehemiah, where's, where we got Nehemiah, right up here. Uh, in the Jewish canon of scripture, there was only one book, Ezra and Nehemiah were one book. And it wasn't until Origen, uh, one of the church fathers from Alexandria, Egypt, he was writing, uh, he was born in 185, lived until 250 AD, he actually separated Ezra and Nehemiah into two books. Uh, that influenced Jerome, who wrote the uh, Latin Vulgate? He translated the uh, the the Bible, the Greek Bible, into Latin, uh, and he made two books, Ezra and Nehemiah. And so that's what we have today. We've got two books, Ezra and Nehemiah. But remember, it comes from the Jewish writings, uh, and it was one book. Even it, uh, when Josephus and others uh, refer to it, it's it's one book. We've got it in two books. Uh, what we have basically in Ezra, if you look at Ezra chapter 1, the, the first six chapters of Ezra uh, are going to be basically just history. And it's, it's, we're not sure who actually wrote it, who wrote Ezra, who wrote Nehemiah. We assume, again, there's several ways of looking at it, but we assume some of it was written by Ezra, and then Nehemiah also was written by Nehemiah. But the early chapters of Ezra are historical, uh, and they're documents. Some of the material appears also at the end of Second Chronicles, and so they're copying information from some document. Now again, Ezra may have done this to kind of catch up to his story. Someone who may have came back and edited and kind of wrote the material, well, what takes place leading up to uh, the appearance of Ezra. If you look on, uh, oh, go, I gave you a package of notes. We're going to get a timeline there. The first page, the first, second, third, fourth page, fifth page are all right out of framework. The, the framework for Christian faith, that's just the timeline. Uh, if you look at that, and we'll take a look at it in the text a little bit, uh, the, the middle column with the most writing gives you the most details about each year. The right column just kind of summarizes or gives you like almost like a title of what's taking place that year. For example, giving you the biblical reference, uh, what, if the verses were being written at that time, uh, and then the events that take place in the right column. So it's a little bit quicker to go through. When you get on your notes, tonight's notes, at the end of that, uh, you're going to come to uh, a, a chart and I don't have a page for it, it looks like this, the chart looks like this. It's the uh, Zerubbabel, Ezra, Nehemiah timeline. And uh, what we've got prophecy from Jeremiah was that it's going to take 70 years uh, of captivity. And if you have the ori original captivity of Daniel being taken in, in 605, that's when Daniel was taken, and you subtract 70 years from that, you're going to end up with the year... Uh, 535, which is real close to uh, Cyrus is going to set the, you know, he's going to take office in seven, 539, or he's going to set, uh, uh, take over the Babylonian Empire. Uh, the captives are going to leave, the first wave is going to leave in 538, and first thing, 537, right at that time, they're going to begin the work on the temple. So this is kind of close to 70 years uh, right there. It's not exactly. But if you go from 586 B.C. when the temple was burnt to the ground, subtract 70 years from that, you get 5, 
16. Now, the temple, when they come back and they begin to right away, they lay the they build the altar and lay the foundation right away in 537, right around this time period, right when they first get back. But there's instant Samaritan opposition. And the Samaritans are the people that have been living there this whole time, ever since the, the temple was burnt, Jerusalem was destroyed. The, the Samaritans are the Gentiles that had been moved in by the Assyrians and they intermarried with the Jews that remained there uh, that had really didn't have any kind of a kingdom. They were just occupied by the Babylonians. And they kind of formed, they kind of continued the Jewish religion combined with some Gentile influence. And when the Jews come back, they're coming back to bring back the original t temple and the original Jewish faith. The Samaritans don't like this. They see an infringement on their territory. Uh, and so there's going to be conflict. Anyway, what happens is there's, there, there's at, right away at this time, after the altar's built and they begin to try to uh, lay the foundation, the Samaritans stop the temple and the Jews just kind of give up. And they give up until the time of uh, Darius uh, arises. We'll talk about him in a moment. And that's when the prophets, right here, the prophets uh, Haggai and Zechariah arise in 520. And these prophecies are dated even in the text of Scripture. And they basically rebuke the people for uh, not building the temple like they're supposed to and encourage them to continue and have a variety of prophecies, even talking into the, the eschatological phase, like you know, in Zechariah. And so the, te the, the temple is finalized in 516. So when we talk about the seven year captivity, the temple is burnt in 586. They begin rebuilding it in 537, 536, but there's opposition, and they don't resume building it until 520, and it's completed in 516. And that's a very clear 70 year break. So if you want to go 605, down to 535 when the Jews return, or if you want to go 586 when the temple is actually burnt and the temple is restored. So the Jews are back in the land in 537, but their temple's not built for another 20 years. So you've got a return of the exiles uh, 20 years before the temple is rebuilt. And so right in there, that is your 70 year break. You could, you know, figure that out. How you, how you go through it. But anyway, on this chart that you see, uh, again, right here deep in the notes, uh, you've got the seven-year captivity. I've got 705 to 537, seven-year captivity. Uh, the temple works better. Zerubbabel returns and the temple is built uh, between 537 and 516. That's Zerubbabel's time. That's one of the leaders. There's also going to be another leader mentioned tonight. Uh, whose name is, uh, besides Zerubbabel, let me see if I, I got to try to pronounce it right. Um, his name is Shesh Bazar. And he is one, Shesh Bazar, and we don't know much about him. Some people try to make him into Zerubbabel, uh, but I think it's clearly not Zerubbabel. Shesh Bazar is going to be the one that comes back with the first uh, people that come back. Ezra is not leading the people back. If you look on uh, that chart again and go to the next page, I've got a little map. That's this page right here. A little map on the top. There's, it's one I drew many years ago in the 80s, and I just stuck it in there. I need to clean them up. But Ezra returns in 458 B.C. So you come back to this right here. 458 B.C. is when Ezra is going to come back. So you got to see right here, the captivity is, the, the Cyrus takes over in 539. The Jews leave in 538 B.C. Uh, they're getting active and rebuilding things beginning in 537. Uh, you can say about that time is when the altar was built. And then there's a break until 520 when the altar, or the, the prophets begin speaking and the temple is done in 516. Notice 516 and 458. Ezra has nothing to do with the rebuild, the return of the exiles, the rebuilding of the temple, has nothing to do with those things. Uh, and also Nehemiah is going to be 446. 
So Ezra and Nehemiah are coming, you know, in, uh, uh, you know, uh, 70 years later, the next century when they are returning. And Ezra and Nehemiah, they, they cross paths. Nehemiah is still working for the Persian king when he is sent back. And he's given permission to go back and rebuild the walls. And he's given a time frame. And then he's got to return to his official duties for the Persian king. So Nehemiah is going to go do his job as an authority of the Persian Empire, a Jew with Persian Empire authority, and build the, get the walls built, oversee some things, and then he's got to return. Ezra and Nehemiah, if they cross paths, uh, if they know each other, uh, it's not real clear. Uh, but they, they're functioning at the same time. And we'll pick up some of these things as we go. But nonetheless, on, on this page right here, the little map on the top, on the other side of the, uh, the time chart, Ezra is going to leave on April 18th, 458 B.C. April, and he's going to arrive in Jerusalem August 4th, 458. That's in Ezra chapter 7 and Ezra chapter 8. Now notice right here, Ezra chapter 7 and 8 is talking about Ezra leaving. This is where it begins to, he's, there's phrases like, uh, I, he uses the word I, I did, I went, they said to me. And this is now personal information in right around 458 B.C. Meaning, these first six chapters, chapters 1 through 6, are historical. It's not Ezra saying, I did these things, or I was there when they sent the, the captives back, when they divided up the, the golden goblets and sent them back to the temple. That's all history that's being recorded in the book of Ezra. Now, Ezra may be writing this, copying it from other documents, but it's happening before he was even born. So these first six chapters are not about Ezra. They're Ezra basically picking up where Second Chronicles ends and then writing the history up until they get back to this place. And if we were actually going to teach Ezra correctly, we would have to start here, teach these events, which we'll talk about, and then right around here, Ezra is going to show up. Uh, but before we get to Ezra, before we get to Ezra's personal account in chapter 7 and 8, you'd have to stop and teach the book of Haggai and Zechariah because they're prophesying to get the temple done. When, by the time Ezra gets to Jerusalem in 458, the temple's been up and running for 40, 55, 60 years. The temple's been up and running, so the priesthood is functioning. In fact, one of the problems Ezra's going to have is the priests are already functioning, but they've also started marrying the foreign women. The Samaritans, they've started marrying. They're not really, they themselves are starting to compromise and become like the Samaritans. And that is where Ezra comes in. It's going to be a, a tragic chapter for us in America to read Ezra and his legalistic behavior and his breaking up of families. I mean, it is, it is astonishing. It is definitely not a chapter that James Dobson teaches. You know, focus on the family and James Dobson. Because Ezra comes in, and just like in, in right here, 538, 537, the Samaritans came in and tried to oppose the building of the temple. The prophets by 520 say, you've got to get this done, and encourage them, and the Jews get it done. So they overcome the Samaritans. Nehemiah is going to show up. The Samaritans are opposing the building of the wall. Remember, they're building... With, with one hand and have a sword in the other hand because the Samaritans are trying to stop them. But what happens with Ezra is what has taken place is the priests have started compromising and allowing Gentile influence into their, their sphere of influence in the temple. And Ezra says, no, he's actually going to have them uh, send their wives and their children away. It, it's like, no, this is, this is not right. And we'll talk about it when we get there. But it's like a, a purifying of the religion of the Jews to get the temple back on track. So there's several things taking place here. Again, we're going from 539 all the way up to 446 with uh, uh, Nehemiah coming in. Uh, the last verses of Ezra are going to be during Artaxerxes with Nehemiah. Uh, but then, to add to it, you've got Esther. Esther is going to be right in here, 
and she's going to marry the Persian king Xerxes. And so you've got Jews coming back, you've got Jews uh, be going, like Ezra's going to go back to help teach the people the word. His, his goal was to go back, just like Nehemiah was to go back and build the wall before Nehemiah, Ezra's goal was to go back and teach. He was a teacher. He was going to teach them the law. And uh, they don't know it. They, 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 they don't understand it. In fact, when we get into it, he's going to have some public reading of Scripture, but the people cannot understand the Scripture because it's in Hebrew. And they're reading it in Hebrew, and no one understands it. So when they read the Scripture publicly, they've got to have someone standing here translating it into Aramaic. And so the, the Jews, when they returned, they picked up, they forgotten Hebrew, and they picked up the language of the Persians, and so you're going to, everything has been Aramaic. In fact, Daniel, we've talked about that before, when Daniel was writing, when he talks to the Jews, he writes it in Hebrew, when it's Jewish prophecy, but when he's talking about world history uh, and recording the history, he's writing it in Aramaic. Even, and that's the way it is in the Dead Sea Scrolls also. It's written in Hebrew, and then it breaks at a certain point. In fact, when you do the book of Daniel, you'll see in your footnotes, it will say, this is in Aramaic, or now he switches back to Hebrew. And so it was a problem for Ezra when he gets back in chapter 7 and 8, and he realizes the people, uh, they've completely started to compromise with the Gentiles in the area, and they don't know the scriptures because they can't read the scriptures because when you read them they don't understand them they have to be translated the hebrews the jews have to have their scriptures translated in the aramaic for them to understand the the word of god it, because it's 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 in a foreign language form at this time so ezra comes back to teach and establish the word of god just like nehemiah comes back to build the walls to protect the people. Now, uh, just finishing up that map, uh, I've got right there where he comes from. He comes from over there by Babylon. There's a place called the Ahava Canal, and that's where he leaves. The distance that he's going to travel, going back and forth from Jerusalem and Babylon, is 1,678 miles. And you see, they leave in April, and he arrives in August, and he talks about that. Uh, there's several other things there to look at, but uh, let's do this real quickly. Uh, just walk through. Look in uh, chapter 1, chapter 1 in Ezra, and we'll come back and start going through this next week. But chapter 1 of Ezra is basically talking about 538, 539 when Cyrus becomes, takes over Babylon and gives the decree the edict that the, the people can return. And it's not just the Jews. This right here, this is the cylinder of Cyrus, right? That's a photograph of the actual cylinder. I took that in the British Museum. That in there is Cyrus making the decree that the people can return back to their homelands and begin rebuilding their temples and rebuilding their cultures of where they've been taken by the Babylonians. Uh, that, and that is what is referred to in chapter 1, uh, verse 1. I'll just read chapter 1, verse 1 of Ezra. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, when it says first year, he's already been king of the Persians and has already defeated uh, in, in Lydia. It's the first time he's taken over the Babylonian Empire. In order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, and notice right there, that's Yahweh. Those are all capital letters. Cyrus says, Yahweh, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any one of his people, and goes through and talks about that, that's being said in 538. And right here, in cuneiform writing in the British Museum, is that decree saying very similar words, not the exact words, but very similar words, that it's liberation, everyone wants to go back. And again, notice it's written, interestingly, it's not written in a, in a, in a tablet where you'd write on a flat surface. It's written in a cylinder, so you could roll it, read it, and roll it while you were reading it. It would be, uh, it, it's the update. You know, you've got the a cuneiform tablet update. 
and it's now the cylinder that they can roll. Just like we have uh, iPhone updates and the tablet updates, well, that's that was their update, going from uh, a flat tablet like this, like the uh, uh, Navoditis tablet, Cyrus. Anyway, that's just a fun thing to point out. But that's what's taking place. So notice again the history in chapter one. Chapter uh, two, it, we're going we're gonna to go through chapter two, but you can see right there, that's the list of the exiles who returned. Um, go to the problem. I'm, I'm looking here to see. Yes, go back to chapter one, verse eight. Cyrus, king of Persia, had them brought to Milthredath, the treasurer, who counted them out to Shesh Bazar, the prince of Judah. Now, um, some say that's Zerubbabel, some say it's not. Do your, does your translations all say Shez, Shez Bazar? Uh, and like in my NIV footnote, it, it says something uh, that it could be Zerubbabel. Uh, I'm going to say that it's, it's not. It's, it's somebody else. Um, it is interesting that they've got a treasure, we'll talk about this too, Mithradath. It is so organized, Nebuchadnezzar had taken these, this gold from the temple and had put it in some kind of a safe keeping place. Uh, and when Cyrus comes in, there's someone that is in charge of it and he goes in and it's all documented. They count it all out. There are probably cuneiform tablets with things written down that will, and look in verse nine, this was the inventory, gold dishes, 30, silver dishes, 1,000, silver pans, 29, and it goes through and lists the items that are being given. So these are, it, it, it would be inventory. This is what we've taken. This is what we're giving to Shezbazer, and Shezbazer, this is what should arrive in Jerusalem. So I mean, it's, it's not just, well, take what you want. It's like these things are being documented and they're supposed to go back to Jerusalem. Now, when we get into Nehemiah, uh, similar numbers are there, but the numbers don't always match. You would, you would like to see them match perfectly so that you have you know, the, the continuity of the scriptures, but for some reason, sometimes the numbers are wrong and you've got to figure out what, what, what happened. Why are the numbers wrong? Sometimes it's in translation. Sometimes it's, it's like what documents were they copying? Again, without attacking the Word of God, and this is by no means an attack on the Word of God, but they are whoever's writing this is not making it up. They're not, they're not, be, be careful as I'm talking here, they're not under the inspiration of God sitting out in the desert somewhere writing like Muhammad was writing the Quran, just writing whatever he wanted to write. That's not what they're doing. They're, they're looking at documents, they're collecting documents similar to what Moses most likely did with the book of Genesis. He just didn't sit on Mount Sinai and just write out the book of Genesis. He had documents, and we, the totally dote, you know, the, the written document or the written account of going all the way through the, the, the book of Genesis. And the same thing here. This is the book of Ezra, and if Ezra is the one compiling this book, or whoever is putting it together, is using documents. And the, because it switches in chapter 7 to Ezra's personal account, uh, his documents, you, you would think that Ezra was the one that went back and got all this information and had access to documents that he's putting all of these things together. He is the teacher, he is a scribe, he does know the languages, so there's a good chance Ezra's writing this. Again, that's, that's, that, there's no way of saying that's absolutely true, but that would be a very good guess. But understand, uh, he's, they're not just making it up. He's using information, using documents. Anyway, that's chapter 1. Uh, chapter 2 then gives you all the people that are going to come back. And we'll go through this. Uh, it's the number who are coming from certain families. It's interesting to see how those numbers vary. How some of the families are, are huge. You know, there's 2,000 from this line and some 98 from this family. And then you get over to verse 36. We'll look at this later. The priests, the descendants of Jediah, and goes through and gives you the, the priest, and then the Levites. Now it's interesting right here, just in noting, if you look in verse uh, 39, and the numbers there, verse 37, 38, 39, how many priests? There's something like 4,000 some priests 
decide to return. Now this is telling. Some 4,000 priests decide, hey, yeah, we're going back. But the Levites, who are also from the line of the priesthood, but they're the Levites, they're the servants, not the priests. Notice how many Levites go back. It looks like a 74. Because the priests are like, yeah, this is what we've been talking about. This is where we rule. We are in charge. We got the prime seat. Now, the helpers who want to go back and assist the priest, not me. Only 74, it looks like, go back. Then there's a group of singers hoping for their big break in the music industry, 128. And then there's others that are listed there, uh, some 139 go back. But again, we'll talk about that. There's temple servants that are listed there. Uh, but again, it's just interesting to note that uh, the priests totally outnumber. I mean, 4,000 compared to 70-some, uh, the Levites. There's not that many Levites that come back. And we'll talk about that. There's also the descendants of servants of Solomon that still claim. See, these genealogies are very important because it says they can say in, in, in uh, 538, they can say my great, great, great grandfather was a servant of King Solomon and they still got that title, they still got that lineage to say we have some claim to this position. Um, uh, there's in here also we will talk about it when we get there. Uh, verse 64 gives you the whole community numbered 42,000 and, and you would talk, you look at those numbers. There is a, also going to be a, a group of priests that can't find their genealogy, that can't find their family records. And uh, they say, well, we are priests. I mean, you know, Grandpa told me he was a priest. They said, do you have documentation? They say it was destroyed in 586 in the fires. It's like, you're out. If you do not have documentation, if you do not have a genealogy, you are nobody. You've lost your, your genealogy. And that is why when you come to uh, Matthew and Luke and they record the genealogy of Jesus, it's like, whoa, what's this? I mean, Jesus has his genealogy going back to David. I mean, who, who, who has records like that? Well, someone from the family of David would have kept those records because it's important. It is your identity. It helps you establish property, your place in the tribe, your place in the community. It's who you are. And again, God is the one who identified the tribes and what tribe. Judah would be the ruling tribe. Levi would be the priestly tribe. The line family of Aaron would be the priest. I mean, all these things were established by God. And so the genealogy is a reflection on what God wants. You lose the genealogy, you lose your place. Now that's, you say, well, that's that's not the way America's, that's not the way America functions. Right, we're not in America, we're in Israel. We're coming out of the Persian Empire after having been destroyed by the Babylonians, going back to rebuild the temple with the priesthood that God established. And if the priests marry a Samaritan, that family is discredited. You either, you either leave and go with now. Some of the priests are going to leave and go up to Samaria and build their own temple. They're going to say, forget, we'll have our own Samaritan, and they're going to break away, and they're going to have their own group in Samaria. And that's another whole story. And that, that still, in a sense, continues today with some of those who are still claiming heritage. Nonetheless, chapter 3 of Ezra, there's where they're going to begin. It says right here, When the seventh month came, and the Israelites had settled in their towns, the people assembled as one man in Jerusalem. And uh, then you have Jeshua, son of Jozadak, and his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, uh, they're there. The Joshua, or Joshua, that would be uh, one of the, the priests that's going to be overseeing. He'd be serving as the high priest. Uh, when we get into Zerubbabel, we're going to find out that Zerubbabel was a descendant of, uh, of the kings, of Josiah, uh, the king Josiah, and then of his son Jehoiachin, excuse me, Josiah, no, no, no. Josiah had three sons, uh, Zedekiah, uh, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim is going to have a son named Jehoiachin. So Josiah has a son named Jehoiakim plus two others. Jehoiakim has a son named Jehoiachin. And Jehoiachin becomes king when Jehoiakim dies and is thrown over the wall during 
the Babylonian invasion during the famine, 19 year old Jehoiachin becomes king and he rules for three months and then in 597 he's taken captive. In 597 Jehoiachin is taken captive. Are you with me on that? Josiah, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and then Jehoiakim had two other brothers. Zedekiah would be the, the youngest one, and then Jehoahaz, uh, who was king right after Josiah and taken to Egypt and never heard from again. Jehoiakim then became king, ruling for the Egyptians in Jerusalem. He ends up rebelling against Nebuchadnezzar and ends up dying. Jehoiachin becomes king for three months as a 19-year-old in 597 B.C. and is taken in the second captivity as a 19-year-old along with Ezekiel. Uh, now, he is put in prison by Nebuchadnezzar um, as a captive. Nebuchadnezzar, are you still with me here? Nebuchadnezzar... Uh, he dies in 562, and Amal Marduk, or Evil Marduk, uh, his name's in the scripture, we'll see that, he takes Nebuchadnezzar's place. That would be his, his son. Uh, Evil Marduk apparently had gone, had been in rebellion, and had been sent to prison. He is released and takes over for his father, Nebuchadnezzar, and during his time as king, he takes Jehoiakim and releases Jehoiakim from prison, and he eats at the king's table. We'll read those verses here in the Bible that say that takes place, but unbelievable, but true. They found a cuneiform tablet in Babylon with Jehoiachin's name on it and his rations that were given to him for him and his family. It's in the Bible. It's on a cuneiform tablet. Jehoiachin was released by evil Marduk, possibly because they were both in prison. And then when Nebuchadnezzar dies, evil was released. He released Jehoiachin. Maybe they, I, we don't know. Maybe they became friends in prison. But he releases Jehoiachin, and he lives as a free man with privileges with the king's table. And he has a son, or has a family, which he's eventually going to produce, Zerubbabel. So Zerubbabel comes from Josiah, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, Zerubbabel. And so he would be, in a sense, the next king. But this line was cursed by Jeremiah, that no more would anyone sit on the throne from the, this, this line. Uh, and Zerubbabel returns as simply a governor He's in the governor position related to King David, related to Josiah. He's in the, the, the line of Judah, but he's going to be the governor. So you've got here in that verse, uh, where were we at? Uh, rebuilding the altar, chapter 3, verse 2. Then Joshua, son of uh, jo Josedek, and his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, son of Shatiel, and his associates began to build the altar of God of Israel and to sacrifice. So between Jehoiachin and Zerubbabel would be Shatil. These guys were born in captivity or in Babylon, and then they're going to return. So that's, that's what takes place in chapter 3, and the temple's rebuilt. Now, look in chapter 3, verse 7. Then they gave money to the masons and carpenters and gave food and drink and oil to the people of Sidon and Tyre so they could bring cedar logs just like Solomon did by the sea from Lebanon to Joppa as authorized by Cyrus, king of Persia, in the second month of the second year. Now, this is now taking place. They're starting to build the, the rebuilding of the temple. Uh, and that, that that's all sounds good. That's 536. So they're, they're getting everything up and running just like Cyrus said. But then in chapter 4, what ends up taking place there is, chapter 4, verse 1, when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, uh, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the families and says, let us help you build it. This is what the Samaritans did. They said, come let us help you. And they says, no, you can't. 
Uh, well, let me just read this verse. Let us help you build because like you, we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Eshar Hardin, king of Assyria, who brought us here. Now, do you understand what they're saying? They're saying, we want to help you build this because we have been worshiping the same God this whole time, but they haven't had a temple, they haven't had an altar in Jerusalem, but they've been worshiping God. What, what, what? You can't worship this God with a different altar at a different location. He can only be worshipped in Jerusalem. So they haven't been worshipping him properly. And they say, we've been doing it ever since the time of Eshar Hayden, the king of Assyrians, who brought us here. Well, what, what? You were brought in here by the Assyrian king? Well, you're not Jewish. You were brought here as, as, as aliens, transported, and were put in here. And then you picked up the remains of of the Israelite religion, which was pagan, the golden calf and all that stuff, and married into the rules that had been left behind, or we're talking about the 722 uh, dispersion by the Assyrians. And so they've got the, the, they claim the same God, but it's the wrong God, wrong worship. They're Gentiles who picked up Israel's rejected religion and what they want to build. Uh, verse 3, the, the appropriate response. It's not like, oh, well, let's all just build a community. Let's just have a community. No, but Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the rest of the heads of the families of Israel answered, you have no part with us in building a temple to our God. We alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, king of Persia, commanded us. No, we've got a command from the king of Persia to build it for Yahweh. We're going to do it. We don't know what, who you've been worshiping. You've not been worshiping the right place. You're not even of the right people. No, you have no part of this. Well, that's going to make them mad. And that's verse 4. Then the people around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. And they did. And so in 536, they, now you see right there in 536, they could have compromised and says, sure, come on in. Let's all just build as a community. It's all about cooperation, love, and fellowship, and potlucks. And they could have built the temple, but it would have been corrupted by the very presence of these people who have been worshiping this God for some 20, 30, 40, 50 years, but you're wrong place, wrong time, wrong sacrifices, wrong, you're not even close. But because they try to do it the right way, they got opposition and they get shut down for 20 years and eventually they go into becoming, they get lazy. Now, in verse 6, it says, At the beginning of the reign of Xerxes, they, long, they lodged, lodged an accusation against the people of Judah and Jerusalem and in the days of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, it goes on and talks. So right here, we're talking Cyrus. Cyrus, and then all of a sudden it jumps to Xerxes, and in the days of Artaxerxes. So between chapter, in chapter 4, they have opposition back here, and the Jews stop building. It doesn't say it specifically here, but they come all the way through. It's Cambyses, Darius I, and then up to Xerxes. Now you've got Esther, who's going to marry him, now all of a sudden, they're lodging a complaint because right at this time, Haggai and Zechariah have been prophesying and the people are starting to try to rebuild and they've got some issues going on up here on who's... So this jumps way ahead into the future there up to the days of King Xerxes, Artax Xerxes. Does that make sense at all? I mean, you see how far we're traveling here. Um, then that takes place, chapter 5 and 6 is all about uh, the letters and the, and the dealings right there. But go to, well, I've got it, haven't got it written down. Go to chapter 7. And now, in chapter 7, now begins Ezra. So all that has been just talked about, all of this history that's been going on up until the time of Ezra and, and after. And now it says right here, after these things, chapter 7, verse 1, during the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, son of Sariah, son of Azariah, son of Hilkiah, son of... He, look at he's got his, look at his genealogy and he's got it nailed down he's got genealogy goes for the first six verses who is this Ezra well let me tell you this I'm a priest and I've got the law I understand it and I'm coming to do my job a son of Aaron the chief priest this Ezra came up from Babylon he was a teacher well versed in the law of Moses which the Lord the God of Israel had given the king had granted him everything he asked for the hand of the Lord his God was on him he goes to Artaxerxes, Artaxerxes, Ezra, and goes, and here's what I want to do. I want to go back 
And I, I've heard, I've seen some of their TV programs and their sermons. I, I, I've listened to some of their radio broadcasts. Uh, they have no idea what they're doing. I'm gonna, I want to go back and teach these people the law of Moses. So he gets permission from Artaxerxes. So once again, he's on a time frame on how long he can go. Just like Nehemiah is going to be sent to go back and do some building and then have to return. Ezra is going to get permission. He's not just going to get on his camel and ride over to Jerusalem. He's going to go to he's going to go to Artaxerxes and get permission. If, if I go to if I go visit one of my sons in wherever they're at in Taiwan or London or wherever I've gone, I get my little passport. I get on the plane and I go. But there's I don't I don't talk to the governor. I don't talk. I don't get permission. Uh, these guys were both, Nehemiah was a cupbearer for Artaxerxes. In fact, right, yeah, right here. This right here, I've told you this before. That's also in the British Museum. That's, that's a whole set of wine bowls. It says right on there, Artaxerxes, king of Persia, what writes all the way around there in cuneiform writing. And there are silver bowls about this big. They're wine bowls. I mean, it's, we don't know. It doesn't have, the, doesn't have Nehemiah's fingerprints, but it was a wine bowl of Artaxerxes. And it was the whole set. And Nehemiah was the wine bearer for Artaxerxes. And so it's possible that he handled these right here. So these people, Nehemiah and Ezra, have access to Artaxerxes and they were getting permission. But anyway, chapter 7, Nehemiah comes up and uh, he, he's going to go through. Uh, okay, look at verse 11. I'm sorry. Chapter, chapter 7, verse 11. This is a copy of a letter King Artaxerxes had given to Ezra, the priest and teacher, a man learned in matters concerning the commands and decrees of the Lord of Israel. Artaxerxes, King of Kings. And that's what it says. That's one of the things it says. King of Kings, King of Persia, all that. It says on the same line. To Ezra, the priest, a teacher of the law of the God of heaven. That's how Artaxerxes addresses Ezra. He's a priest. He's a teacher of the law of the God of heaven. Greetings. Now I, Artaxerxes, decree that any of the Israelites in my kingdom, including priests and Levites who wish to go to Jerusalem uh, with you, may go. Now, in my notes, I've got this written here. This could be the decree that Daniel spoke of. From the issuing of the decree uh, in Daniel 9.25, that would, that would take this year right here, 458. That's when some people use this year. I've tried it. 458, you've got 483 years before the Messiah comes and is cut off and will have nothing. So 458, that will put you right around 30 AD, right around the time of... Again, I, I, we could figure this out. You, got, you could do all the years, the months, and the leap years. But it puts you very close, just in a rough looking at this, puts you right around this, and this could be the decree that our text, or that Daniel's referring to. It's just, at least it's worth considering. But that is the decree, and it goes all the way through chapter uh, 7, verse 13, all the way up till verse 26 of what Artax Xerxes is saying about Ezra. Verse 27 then is, Praise be to the Lord, the God of our fathers, who has put it into the king's heart to bring honor to the house of the Lord in Jerusalem in this way, and who has extended his good favor to me, see right there, to me, Ezra, before the king and his advisors and all the king's powerful officials. Because the hand of the Lord my God was on me, I took courage and gathered leading men from Israel to go up with me. So as again, now he's going to get his own group, and he's going to go back, and he's coming in, with a full-fledged teaching degree to straighten this mess up with his teaching. And then in verse 8, it talks about the families that return with him. Um, we could read all, there's the chapter 8, verse 15. I assembled them at the canal that flows towards Ahava, and that's that map I showed you earlier, and we camped there three days, and it talks all about them getting ready to make their journey on, from April to August, uh, to Jerusalem. Chapter 9, verse 1, After these things had been done, the leaders came to me and said, The people of Israel, including the priests and the Levites, have not kept themselves separate from the neighboring peoples with their detestable practices. And then it begins to list all 
they're all the things that they're doing. Now watch this. Are you ready? Are you ready? Now we're way ahead of ourselves. Chapter. Now he talks about all the detestable things. Uh, the Canaanites, Hittites, the Perizzites, Jebusites, all the things. They have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons and have mingled the holy race with the peoples around them. Whoa, they don't want to preach that in America. And the leaders and officials have led the way to, in this unfaithfulness. Watch this. Watch what Ezra said, does. Verse 3. This is crazy right here. I mean, I'm not saying crazy, but it's like we don't even understand it. When Ezra hears what they have done, when I heard this, I tore my tunic and cloak, pulled hair from my head and beard, and sat down appalled. Then everyone who trembled at the words of God of Israel gathered around me because of the, uh, this unfaithless of the exiles, and I sat there appalled until the evening sacrifice. When he gets there and finds out what have they done, how far have they gone, they're living just like the Canaanites. I mean, we might as well go back to the days of the judges. It's like, I mean... The pulling out of his hair is just, uh, I mean, that's, that's amazing morning practices right there. Anyway, that's, that's your man Ezra. Chapter 10, he's going to confess his sins and their sins and continues. And then we continue, well, here, chapter uh, 10, verse 18. Among the descendants of the priest, the following had married foreign women. Here's a list of all the priests. The book ends with a list of the priests and the Levites and the gatekeepers who had married foreign women, and we are going to have nothing to do with these people because they're now, they've just, they've just compromised. There's your book of Ezra right there. And then, of course, in the Jewish Bible, you just, you just go to the next chapter, which is Nehemiah chapter 1, the words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. And he gets in the month of Keslev in the 20th year, and he goes on, he's in Susa, and he goes on, and now you've got the whole story of Nehemiah. And in this book, uh, there is some talk uh, of Ezra. Look in chapter 8 of this book of Nehemiah. Um, and we're going to have to put all this together. I'm just kind of showing you what we've got to weave together. Now, Nehemiah's going back and he's built the, the walls, and you've got the, uh, there's all kinds of lists of people. But chapter 8 when the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled as one man in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the scribe, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So in the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it out loud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform built on for the occasion. Talks about it. Um, I'm just trying to see where it talks about translating it. But anyway, that's, that's, that, that, I'm just showing you, that's where Ezra pops up in the book of Nehemiah. And we continue that. Now, what I would like to do is, is this. Is take, take your, this timeline, and I just want to go through and get some historical background here because this is some of the things that's going to be, it'll be like the background as we go through Ezra. And we're starting right here in uh, 586 and kind of going this way. I want to introduce you, you already know these things. I want to introduce you to Cyrus, Cambyses, his son. When Cyrus dies in battle, suddenly Cambyses, his son, becomes king of the Persians. His goal is to defeat Egypt. And he does. He goes down and defeats Egypt. He does make a mistake and go so far trying to go for, across the desert that thousands of his soldiers die. They have found that army buried in the sand, just bones buried in the sand. Uh, he comes back, but somewhere in 522, now he murdered his brother um, uh, 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 Smyrtus. And somewhere around, when he's going through Israel, right around Mount Carmel, he dies mysteriously and disappears from history. Back during this time, a pseudo Smyrtus arises in Babylon, someone who's faking to be the brother. They said, I really wasn't killed, I escaped. 
uh, he's one of the priests, one, or magi. He's exposed, and one of Cyrus's generals, Darius the first. See, there's going to be a Darius back here with Nebuchadnezzar. This is Darius the first, or Darius the great. He's going to reorganize the kingdom because everything started kind of collapsing at this time. Reorganize the kingdom, and Darius is going to be very prominent during the reigns of Haggai, or Book of Haggai, Zechariah, and Ezra five and six. Darius is going to be doing an outstanding job, and he'll he's going to be one of Cambyses' generals. Following him is going to be Xerxes. Xerxes is going to be the one who decides that he wants to go to war with the Greeks. Because the Greeks have been coming across into the territory of, of Asia Minor, uh, where the seven churches of John were at on the coast. And, and Xerxes decided, I'm just going to go put an end to the Greeks, drive them back, and he has all kinds of trouble. Now this is where the book of Esther comes in. Because Xerxes, remember the book of Esther starts with, he has making, a, everybody from all the provinces came, all the leaders, all the generals, and has a big show of all the military equipment. That's what Xerxes is doing. He's drumming up support for uh, invading Iraq, if you would make a comparison to what the Americans, what we did. But he's drumming up to so bring everybody in. This is our war machinery. This is how great we are. And we are going to go to Greece and drive them back. And, and expand our territory. So everybody's all like, yeah, let's go. That's Esther chapter 1. But remember, chapter 1, they're all drinking, they're celebrating, they, got, they saw all the war machines, and they have all their strategies, and they have all their meetings and their conferences, and now they're having a big party afterwards. He calls for his wife to come out, Vashti, and she won't. Now, some speculate that she was pregnant with Artaxerxes at the time. That might be why she didn't come out. That's that's another whole story. Anyway, he deposes her, has nothing to do with her. And when he goes to goes to Greece, he's defeated, humiliated. We'll talk about that. We should talk about that. Uh, totally destroyed. And comes back uh, in, in bad shape, politically. And uh, that's where he needs a wife. And that's where he spends the rest of his time finding a wife. And Esther, that's where Esther comes in. And that's the story of Esther and Artaxerxes. Or Xerxes. He has a son named Artaxerxes, uh, and here we go. On, on your notes, I'm not sure how much time we've got here. I look, I forgot. It, it's just very interesting. So on that first page, look at 586 on that for very first column. Halfway down, that's when that's when uh, the Nebuchadnezzar destroys the temple, takes everybody captive, but he leaves a bunch of people in Jerusalem or in Judah, including Jeremiah. Jeremiah, one of the bullet points says he's invited to go to Babylon as a royal guest. That's what Nebuchadnezzar says. Jeremiah chooses to stay in Judah. They say, wherever you want to go. So he stays there. Jeremiah then, is, according to Jeremiah 40, Jeremiah is given provisions and money and a money gift from Nebuchadnezzar. Here's provisions, and here's a financial donation to you and your ministry. Take care of yourself here. Good luck. You can come back to Babylon, live with Daniel, but if you want to stay here, that's fine. They appoint Gedaliah as, a, 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 as the governor, the Babylonian representative. He's a Jew that's going to lead the people as the governor. But the people who rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar, rejected Jeremiah, they assassinate Gedaliah and realize we're in trouble because we killed the governor Nebuchadnezzar appointed. He's going to come kill us. We're going to go to Egypt. Uh, he's a, he's a, a, October 7th when Gedaliah is assassinated. They decide to go to Egypt. We talked about that before. They tell Jeremiah, asking for advice. He says, don't go. They go anyhow. They take Jeremiah with them. Uh, and Jeremiah prophesies that they shouldn't go because that's Nebuchadnezzar's next stop is Egypt. Um, they end up down on an island in the Nile River called the Elephantine. It, it's a city there on an island in, in Upper Egypt. So you know, going further to the south. They found a papyrus, many papyrus scrolls of the Jewish writings. They formed a community, and it's called the Elephantine Papyrus. And so that's, that's, that's documented there with that find. Uh, go over to 562. You got all these things taking place in 569. Uh, a lot of those things are recorded in uh, Daniel. Uh, Daniel's still alive, of course. In 562, in September, Nebuchadnezzar dies in 562, and that's where in 561, evil Maradoc, or uh, 
evil Merodach, Marduk, either way of spelling, uh, becomes king, and he releases 55-year-old Jehoiachin from 36 years in prison. And I should read that. That's in the in Chronicles and in Jeremiah. Uh, in 559, Cyrus begins reigning in Persia. He's a young man. Cyrus, in 559, he's reigning in Persia. Uh, Nergleiser assassinates evil Maradoc as king of Babylon. Uh, he'd been an official of Nebuchadnezzar uh, when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem. In 556, Nebuchadnezzar's son-in-law, Nabuditus, begins to reign. He marries Nebuchadnezzar's daughter, Nidocris, Nidocris, and they have a son named Belshazzar. This daughter of Nebuchadnezzar, Nidocris, is the one who comes out and talks to Belshazzar at his feast and says, your father had a man that could advise him on things like this, and they send for Daniel. So she remembers the man Daniel from Nebuchadnezzar, her father's time. Um, 554, Nabuditus leaves Babylon and leaves it to his son Neb uh, Belshazzar. Nabuditus, uh, he who married Nebuchadnezzar's daughter, he goes south into Arabia. Now, I just read a book. I, this is off subject, but it's interesting, and I shouldn't even say it because it gets so far off subject. But he goes south into Arabia. He wants to worship the god Sin. Not Sin like an evil behavior, but the, everybody's worshiping in uh, Babylon at this time. Everybody's worshiping uh, Mar Mardoch. He wants to worship the god Sin. So he goes south to build temples into Arabia. That's where uh, Nabuditus goes, leaving Belshazzar up there. So the priests of Mardoch, they, they're angry. They don't want anything to do with him, so there's revolt within the land. He goes down into Arabia and probably brings with him certain magi. And I just read a book that makes a very good case that the, the magi that came to see Jesus were the Nabataeans. They came from Pet the Petra area up from the bottom of the Dead Sea over to see him. And uh, they have nothing to do with coming all the way from uh, Babylon, they instead came from right in this general area where he had gone down in this area. And again, it's a whole great theory. And I shouldn't even say anything about that. But anyway, uh, I did. Um, in, okay, turn the page. I'm killing it right here. Um, four, 546, Cyrus defeats Croesus. That's uh, the very wealthy, you know, Midas touch in, in Asia Minor, Lydia. So Cyrus is rising. Um, 538, you can see that's when Ezra 1, 2 takes place. That's when he makes his decree. 537, that's Ezra chapter 2. 536, that's Ezra chapter 3. 525, uh, after Cyrus is killed, Cambyses becomes king. And now realize... The, 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 they've already gone back and they've stopped building the temple. See, the Jews are back in the land during this time, but now in 530 when Cambyses begins to reign, the Jews have just stopped. They've got the altar built, they've got the foundation, but now they're just basically just kind of hanging out, you know, living their lives, waiting for the prophecies of Haggai to come in 520. So Cambyses uh, invades Egypt, uh, 522, the guy's name is Gamata, that's pseudo Smyrna. he's faking to be Cambyses' brother. Cambyses dies on Mount Carmel somewhere, we don't know, no one knows what happened to him. And Darius Estapes, or Darius the Great, becomes king. And within two years, he uh, stabilizes the empire. And then with his reign, right here, with his rise in 521, 521, when Darius stabilized the empire, that's when God calls Haggai and Zechariah to prophesy to the Jews who've been hanging out since 538, not doing anything because they've got opposition from the Samaritans. Uh, Darius stabilized the empire. God calls Haggai and Zechariah and says, let's get started. Uh, that's what Ezra writes in chapter 5 and 6. And you can see right there that year 520, look at all the things in column. Haggai is prophesying, Zechariah is prophesying. You get Haggai chapter 1, Haggai chapter 2, Zechariah chapter 1, Ezra 5, 6, Haggai chapter 2. 
by 516, the temple has been rebuilt. And uh, we'll have to pick this up next time. If you go over to, uh, down to the 585, oh yeah, right there, 590, that's the Battle of Marathon. You might want to read about the Battle of Marathon, that's the Persians and the Greeks. Then 585, Xerxes begins to reign in 585, and that's where Ezra 4 is recorded that. Uh, and in 483, Xerxes displays his vast wealth and military power at a banquet in preparation for his invasion of Greece. And that's Esther chapter 1. Well, in 481, 480, and 479, Xerxes goes to war, spends three years away fighting Greece. You've got the Battle of Thermopylae. This battle is the base of the movie 300. If you ever saw the movie 300, this is that movie. That features the Spartan king Leonidas, Leonidas and his 300 men who fight the invading king Xerxes. Uh, then the Battle of Salamis, Persian occupy Athens and burn the temple. That's why Alexander goes back and burns Persepolis later because the Greek or the Persians came and burnt Athens. Uh, the Persians moved their ships into the strait through the bottleneck, thinking the, the breached Greek trireme ships are trapped but they get stuck in there, and Xerxes is sitting on his throne, an ivory throne, watching over from a hill, watching the battle, and just watches all of his ships get bottlenecked in there, run into each other, and get destroyed. So he watches the defeat of his, his navy, uh, leaving behind one-third of his troops, which then burn Athens to the ground. Then the Battle of Pla Plataea, Plataea, in what looked like the, the route of the Greeks, the Persians failed to stay organized and are driven out from Greece. These Greek battles fulfilled Daniel 11.2, a fourth Persian king. Daniel says in 11.2, a fourth Persian king who will be far richer will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. And this sets the stage for the rise of Alexander. So the fourth king, Cyrus to one, Cambyses two, Darius three, the fourth Xerxes is the fourth king that stirs up the Greeks prophesied by Daniel. Uh, then, then in 478, Esther goes to Xerxes and becomes queen. Because after he comes back now, after three years of battle, uh, he's looking for his queen. And uh, that's where you get the story of Esther takes place. And then uh, in 465, Xerxes is inside his bedchamber when he's assassinated by three conspirators. Remember Mordecai exposed the conspiracy against him? and received rewards later on at the end of the book of Esther. Uh, a couple years later, Xerxes is finally assassinated. Uh, they convince Artax, Xerxes, Xerxes' son, to slay his oldest brother. They then try to kill Artax, Xerxes, who is only wounded, but kills his attackers. Artax, Xerxes becomes the Persian emperor, who will reign for 41 years. So with Xerxes' assassination, they convince Artax, Xerxes, to kill his brother, which he does, so he can become king. And then they decide to kill Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes fights off, it's like some action movie, fights off his attackers and becomes king for 41 years. And this is where Ezra and Nehemiah now know this Artaxerxes. And again, he, he, can, he can fight, he, like I said, he defended himself. And that takes us up to the time of Ezra and Nehemiah where they start to interact with Artaxerxes. That's a lot of information. That's a background of what we're gonna be doing. Next time we'll go back over here to Ezra and start going through it. I just want you to know what's going to take place, Ezra chapter 1 through 6, just a lot of history and things being set in place. We'll refer to Haggai and Zechariah, but we're not going to stop and teach those books now. We'll go back to them. Uh, but they are very important right here with the Jews. And then Ezra's going to show up here during the reign of Artaxerxes, where he's going to be talking in first person along with Nehemiah on what's taking place during Artaxerxes' reign. And again, just to point out again, I think Joel takes place sometime after all of these events. That's what we just finished. I'll pray and we are finished. Father, we do thank you for the chance to look into these things. We ask that we would, again, handle them diligently, that we would use them for direction in our own lives. But, Father, we would have a greater understanding to put your word in perspective and see the way you move in history, the way you do things, and, again, be able to live a life that is a life of worship and faithfulness to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for your time.